This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Sege, as I explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey everyone, welcome back. In 1902, electrical pioneers met for the first time in Berlin, now Kitchener, Ontario, to discuss wiring Ontario's customers together to form a provincial electricity grid. Ontario's electricity grid, like all grids around the world, was designed as a one-way street to generate, transmit, and deliver electricity to customers. It's no secret that nowadays new technologies are shaking up the way we produce and use electricity. Back then, these pioneers likely couldn't have imagined that the electricity grid would become a two-way interactive system capable of supporting variable supply from renewable energy or accommodating electric vehicles, energy storage, home generation, and a host of other innovations. As the demand for electricity grows, Ontario's supply is diversifying, evolving, and transforming at a speed we haven't seen in this industry. One thing is for certain, it's going to be one electrifying ride. On today's show, we're diving into the heart of Ontario's power system and shining a light on the organization that manages the province electricity sector. As we mentioned before, we are at the forefront of a power revolution. Of course, we need someone driving the ship to provide guidance on how Ontario's power system adapts a cleaner and more interactive machine. So here's today's big question. What is driving the transformation of Ontario's power system and what are the potential opportunities and challenges? Joining us today is Leslie Gallinger, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Independent Electricity System Operator. Under her leadership, the IESO oversees the safe and reliable operation of Ontario's bulk electricity system, ensuring affordable electricity is available when and where people need it. Leslie, so great to have you join us today. Now, your knowledge and experience of the electricity industry is extensive. Can you talk to us a bit about what drew you to a career in energy sector and what led you to your current role? Well, thank you for that, Dan. It's it's great to be here. And I have spent the majority of my career in the electricity sector. After spending the first third in a different sector, I certainly benefited from working all across North America and in Europe for some very sophisticated multinational organizations with very talented team members. However, I always had this interest in electricity. And just just for a funny story, my first grade school in Ontario was Sir Adam Beck. So I wonder if that was a bit of foreshadowing. But in reality, I had friends and colleagues in the sector who spoke quite passionately about the impact they were making with the work they were doing. And I was attracted to that. Uh, And sure, I had some skills that I thought would be transferable. And the role that I have now embodies all of that as we at the IESO are helping inform and execute on energy policy, on electricity policy specifically, that will support Ontarians as we transition to an electrified and decarbonized future. I honestly couldn't imagine a better role to be in at this moment. At a high level, Leslie, what is the independent electricity system operator and what is it responsible for with respect to Ontario's power system? The IESO works at the heart of Ontario's electricity system, ensuring that electricity is available where and when it is needed. We monitor Ontario's demand in real time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
balancing supply and demand and directing the flow of electricity across the province's transmission lines. We also oversee the electricity market, which includes putting mechanisms in place to increase competition and ensure cost-effective supply. And finally, we also plan the electricity system by working with Indigenous communities, with municipalities and stakeholders to forecast demand and secure enough supply to meet Ontario's needs as far as 20 years out. Okay, very interesting. Um, Finally, looking forward to your answer on this one here. Can you walk us through how you oversee and manage the electricity system, such as determining the type of supply required to meet demand for electricity in the province in the short, medium, and long term? Yeah, thanks. That that is a, a good and, and big meaty question. Um, so we've we've spoken uh, a, a lot about uh, where we are now. So after having years of surplus electricity, Ontario is entering a period of growing electricity needs, and and demand is expected to increase by an average of two percent annually over the next two decades due to electrification uh, and economic growth in various sectors, including residential, agricultural, and mining. One way that the IESO helps meet these growing needs is by securing new supply. In the short term, we have uh, the annual capacity auction that we conduct that allows existing resources to compete. This is cost-effective and allows the IESO to adapt to changing supply and demand conditions on a year-by-year basis. We also look at three to five year commitments for other resources. This time frame provides more certainty while ensuring it doesn't get locked into commitments that no longer reflect those changing needs of electrification. And finally, in the long term, we look 20 years out to secure resources that require significant upfront investments in order to give suppliers the confidence they need to make those investments. So it's it's a bit of a layer cake with those three time frames. Great segue here. Okay. What do you see as the ISO's role in the future planning of the evolving electricity grid and your role in supporting the changing energy needs of the decarbonized economy? As Ontario's electricity system planner, we certainly have the long view. Our role is to ensure that Ontario's current and future energy needs are met both reliably and affordably. Our corporate strategy calls out three main ways in which we do this. We ensure system reliability while supporting cost effectiveness. We're driving business transformation within the IESO and also driving and guiding the sector's future by working closely with Indigenous communities, municipalities, and stakeholders. On the decarbonization front, Our main role is to enable technologies that will help us decarbonize. There's lots of emerging energy resources that can help us build a zero emissions electricity grid. And the IESO ensures that these resources can all participate in Ontario's electricity system and markets. We're procuring new resources under our flexible resource adequacy framework. We recently announced the procurement of over 800 megawatts of energy storage which is the largest energy procurement, energy storage procurement in Canada to date. That combined with 250 megawatts of the Oneida battery storage project, the IESO with these projects is taking steps to integrate this valuable and flexible resource. And in last December's publication of Pathways to Decarbonization, we explored ways in which Ontario can move forward to an emissions-free electricity system. The Ministry of Energy consulted on our Pathways report and recently, uh, on July 10th, very recently, uh, announced a series of actions in its report, Powering Ontario's Growth. And those actions include collaborating with Bruce Power and Ontario Power Generation on a pre-development work to uh, to consider potential new nuclear generation, reporting back on the design of our second long-term procurement, which will acquire new non-emitting resources, supporting a Ministry of Energy consultation on a post-2024 conservation demand management framework, 
and assessing additional transmission needs to support new and growing generation and demand in the province. So quite a list of, of work for us ahead uh, that we're very excited to, to undertake. And, and as our system operator for the province, we're certainly at the center of all of this. There'll be a continuing need for coordination with the broader electricity sector in order to plan an orderly transition to a decarbonized grid. There will also be an increased need to revisit how we plan the electricity system. The ISO is looking forward to working with the Electrification and Energy Transition Panel to identify ways to adapt and evolve existing frameworks in order to increase transparency and ensure communities and stakeholders are more aware of what we're doing and why. This work, uh, the work of the EETP, also takes a broader economy-wide view, which reflects how the electricity sector is becoming increasingly dependent on other sectors like industry and transportation. So, you know, in short, a lot of work uh, and some very exciting work ahead. Follow-up question here for you. Now, some Ontarians are concerned about moving to variable renewable energy sources like wind and solar, while others are concerned about continuing use of natural gas. What have you uncovered in your work about these issues, and what would you like residents of Ontario to know? Yeah, great, great question, Dan. Every type of generation has its own strengths and drawbacks based on its unique attributes, which is why Ontario maintains a diverse supply mix that can adapt to changing system conditions quickly. Renewables, such as wind and solar, are not emitting when they generate electricity, but they're also intermittent, meaning how much electricity they produce can change rapidly in response to weather conditions. And to help with this, the IESO is looking into hybrid facilities that combine renewables with energy storage. By 2026, we'll also have about 1,300 megawatts of energy storage on the grid, which will help more efficiently integrate renewables. We're also going to start designing our second long-term procurement, which will focus on acquiring non-emitting resources. And we'll be engaging on, on this with stakeholders and communities as we go. Natural gas, for example, has the main advantage that it can respond quickly to changing demand and system conditions, making it an important resource for us as we seek to maintain reliability. Ontario's demand fluctuates constantly throughout the day, and having access to natural gas can help us respond to sudden changes and maintain a balance across the system. It's also very important to recognize, and, and, and something I'd like to emphasize for your listeners, that overall emissions from Ontario's electricity sector are extremely low. The sector accounts for about 3% of the province's total emissions. While this may increase slightly in the future, the continued existence of natural gas on the grid is an important resource to help us transition, and it'll enable the near-term electrification of other sectors, which in total will drive down Ontario's emissions. Okay, Leslie, how will the efficiency upgrades at existing natural gas facilities contribute to meeting the growing demand? And what is the plan for these facilities as emerging technologies mature and the reliance on natural gas decreases? Yes, as I, and as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, Ontario is definitely entering a period of increased demand. And so with many existing contracts expiring uh, and nuclear plants undergoing refurbishments or scheduled to be decommissioned, coupled with increasing electrification of other sectors, the province is going to need more power in the immediate future, and the natural gas expansions can help with this. In our Pathways to Decarbonization report, we, we looked at the questions the minister posed to us. We looked at a moratorium scenario that would phase out natural gas over time as newer non-emitting resources come online. In the report, we concluded that we could be less reliant on natural gas in Ontario by the year 2035 and completely phased out by 2050. Efforts were made to align this report with clean electricity regulations, and, and that recognizes that the contribution of natural gas may be restricted over time. But for the meantime, we have you know, the important transitional resource needs uh, that natural gas fulfills. Okay. In May of 2023, the IESO announced that it was moving forward with the largest procurement of energy storage in Canada. What can you tell us about these storage projects and their benefits? 
Yeah, this was a very exciting announcement for us. The the energy storage projects we announced in May were for grid-connected battery storage systems, which will be an important step towards the transition to a non-emitting supply mix and will support grid reliability. The procurement was the culmination of the work we've done over the last several years to understand the potential of battery storage to provide supply and reliability services to the grid. The biggest advantage of energy storage is that it can charge during off-peak hours when the provincial electricity demand is low and then inject energy back into the grid during peaks when demand is high, which makes it very flexible and a resource that can help us optimize the efficiency of other resource types. And we also see battery storage as a key enabler of decarbonization. It'll help us to integrate more renewables, such as wind and solar, onto the system, but also get more out of our current nuclear and hydro fleet. By charging during these off-peak hours, energy storage can use up uh, any surplus green power from Ontario's existing nuclear and hydro facilities. Now, how does this procurement help ensure system reliability during nuclear refurbishment and support the overall energy transformation in Ontario? The procurement will help with the transition away from natural gas and is certainly about maintaining reliability at a time when multiple uh, refurbishments are underway. In particular, the Pickering generating station is scheduled to go out of service mid-decade. And so right around that time, those energy storage projects are expected to be online. Certainly the timelines of the procurements uh, were, were aligned, understanding what the system conditions would be at that time. Leslie, I'd like to dig into your fascinating Pathway to Decarbonization report just a bit. Ontario has one of the cleanest electricity system in North America, contributing only 3% to the province's greenhouse gas emissions. That doesn't sound like a lot. So why is it important to eliminate the remaining 3% of emissions from the grid? Yeah, another another really interesting question and, and the, the subject of a lot of conversations we've been having. We know that electricity use is going to increase in the coming years, uh, driven by an economic growth and electrification across other sectors. Transportation is becoming increasingly electrified as are industrial processes such as steel smelting. And as the pace of electrification speeds up, the efforts and investments being made by businesses and households to electrify will increase society's reliance on electricity as a fuel. And electricity is only as clean as the resources we use to make it. So um, that 3%, uh, if we don't tackle that remaining 3%, we will see an increased reliance on less clean generating sources. I mean, tackling climate change is certainly an economy-wide effort, and clean electricity is a fundamental enabler of those climate change solutions. Thanks for that, Leslie. Now, I have a follow-up question for you. The ISO presents two scenarios to address decarbonization. What are they and what key assumptions and drivers were discovered with your analysis? So our first scenario was the moratorium scenario, where the ISO looked at restricting the procurement of additional natural gas. And this assessment showed that a moratorium would be feasible beginning in 2027 and that Ontario could be less reliant on natural gas by 2035. At that point, the system would not require additional emitting generation to ensure reliability, provided that other forms of non-emitting supply could be added to the system in time to keep pace with demand growth. The second scenario is our our pathways to decarbonization scenario. This scenario assumed aggressive electrification of the transportation and industrial sectors and that attaining a completely decarbonized grid would be possible by 2050 while balancing reliability and costs. So you can see a lot of variables came to play in that second scenario. Perfect. Thanks, Leslie. Now, what are your thoughts on where Canada stands on its road to meet the 2035 and 2050 targets? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's what we're all looking towards and and bridging the work of today with the needs of a futurized decarbonization, a futurized decarbonized world will be challenging and complex. A collaborative approach across all sectors of the economy will certainly be necessary to achieve this. 
From Ontario's perspective, we're in a strong starting position. Our electricity system is already close to 90% emissions free. Most of the generation coming from hydro and nuclear resources. And in our pathways report, we identify that for Ontario at least, a moratorium on natural gas could be possible by 2035 and a fully decarbonized electricity system by 2050, provided that new non-emitting supplies and services online. So we certainly had those uh, goals in mind uh, for Ontario as we, as we created that pathways to decarbonization work. Now, Leslie, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges facing the electricity industry in Canada today? And what are the biggest opportunities? Yeah, I, I, I anchor on the word orderly because I've used it a lot. The biggest challenge I see is main, managing the significant transformation that's underway and doing it in an orderly fashion. Electrification is requiring the electricity system to expand and produce more power. While decarbonization puts pressure on the grid to rely more heavily on low carbon resources, many of which are still in their early days of development. Across the country, every province is faced with similar challenges. The recently formed Canadian Electricity Advisory Council will provide advice to the Minister of Natural Resources on ways to accelerate investment and promote sustainable, affordable, reliable electricity systems. I mean, and I have the privilege of being on this panel. It's exciting work with colleagues from across the country, many of whom come from provinces in very different stages of decarbonization. We're sharing best practices and all working towards similar goals. For Ontario, we're entering a period of emerging electricity system needs starting in the 2020s. These electricity and energy capacity needs will continue through to 2040. So demand is expected to increase at nearly 2% per year, as I, as I mentioned earlier. All of this presents incredible opportunities for Ontario's communities. New technologies are creating economic growth opportunities and setting the stage for Ontario to build a highly skilled workforce. The push to decarbonize will have significant impacts on economy-wide emissions reductions. And building the electricity grid of the future also presents opportunities to collaborate and strengthen relationships with Indigenous communities and municipalities. Back to my first comment, the pace of this change is a vital consideration. We need to strike the right balance between decarbonizing the grid while it's still ensuring electricity and energy remain reliable and affordable. If we go too fast, the cost may impede electrification. If we go too slow, we're not going to have the supply available as demand increases. So it really is about thinking this through orderly, and it's it's an all-hands-on-deck challenge. Okay, moving along here. Maybe you could walk us through some of the scope for what's required to decarbonize Ontario's electricity system. What does an achievable pathway to net zero look like? Yeah, I, that's the uh, that's the the work of the IESO on a regular basis. I, I mean, I can't underscore my last point enough, which is that's vital that the transition occurs in an orderly manner. We absolutely need to act, but we need to act in a carefully managed way that balances decarbonization with reliability and affordability. Large infrastructure uh, such as hydroelectric plants and nuclear facilities and transmission lines can take 15, 10 years, uh, and sometimes more to build. Significant investments in capital and materials and labor will be required to build out a fully decarbonized system. And one study I read estimated that 14,000 strong labor force participants uh, would um, that are that are currently working on our electricity infrastructure would need to increase by a factor of six. So you know that's a huge investment in training and and getting people ready to build all of the things we need to build. Uh, indigenous communities and municipalities also have a voice in how and where new infrastructure is located. So meaningful and transparent discussions about siting and land use will be needed. And while many technologies will be needed to decarbonize the grid are already known, some are not known and not commercialized yet. And so those are low carbon fuels, small modular reactors still in development at this point. It'll be important for Ontario and for Canada to continue to invest in these and other, other innovations as well in supporting the pathway. 
We need energy plans uh, to be approved and new infrastructure needs to be planned, permitted, and cited. Uh, regulatory and approval processes, such as the environmental impact assessments, need to be resourced appropriately and streamlined to enable all of these builds to happen. Uh, we also need the supporting transmission infrastructure to be planned and built uh, on, on similar timelines as demand growth and as new supply comes online. And under underlying all of that, we need to carefully manage the costs to ensure the actual impact on total energy costs is affordable and that they do not diverge uh, significantly in Ontario from those of our neighbors in Manitoba and Quebec and in the US. So lots of, again, lots of facets, but but work that can be uh, itemized now and definitely planned forward. Cool. What are some of IESO no regret actions that can be taken to help meet those growing demands? Yeah, I think the minister anchored on some of those in his uh, Powering Ontario's Growth Report. Uh, Ontario can certainly continue to acquire new non-emitting resources and incentivize energy efficiency through our Save on Energy programs. Uh, sector partners can also begin planning and siting for new potential projects. Uh, partnerships between municipal, provincial, and federal governments will also be uh, will also be key, and we need to continue to develop those relationships now while we're also revisiting the regulatory frameworks that that may hinder and prevent progress. Uh, last but but certainly not least, we must track our progress in an open and transparent way. There's there's no uh, there's no one way we can say decarbonization happens. It's a gradual change that will take place over many years uh, and and require lots of little steps to to make progress. And the, certainly the government's recent response to our reports puts in motion some of those actions, including asking us at the ISO to explore opportunities to enable future generation in Northern Ontario and reducing the reliance on natural gas generation in the GTA. The ministry has also asked the ISO to begin consultations on a competitive transmitter selection framework for future lines. With electricity supply expected to continue to grow over the next 20 to 30 years, um, you know, that's what we're doing now, um, you know, in terms of planning. But we're also uh, we're also working to secure new capacity and leveraging our existing assets. So that is through our, our very thorough resource adequacy framework, which was put in place uh, that outlines our strategy to get that new supply in the short, medium and long term. Uh, a key piece of this is competitive procurements and the processes that have been used to date, including the annual capacity auction. Um, and But, you know, there's also work being done that we're leveraging by our energy efficiency and demand response programs that, that uh, get back to what individuals and what individual businesses can do to support uh, decarbonization. We've got market renewal going on. We've got medium and long-term procurement. So lots of action underway, um, all of them no regret that can, that can be um, continued to, to meet this demand. Now, Leslie, with electricity supply expected to grow the next 20 to 30 years, what is the ISO doing to secure new capacity and how is it leveraging existing assets? Yeah, great, great question. So um, in, in terms of uh, generating new supply or acquiring new supply, that's really our resource adequacy framework. Um, it outlines, uh, you know, it outlines the work we're doing both in the short, medium and long term to competitively procure new resources. We've recently done the procurements for uh, for batteries and for natural gas upgrades and expansions. We'll be launching our uh, next procurement very shortly and designing the one after that. So it's that layer cake approach that I that I mentioned. Um, we've also, uh, you know, can, can anchor back in the strides we've taken uh, in the current procurements to, to secure. We've had great resources come to bear um, and, and participate in those procurements. So so we're we're very hopeful that future procurements will also be um, be very successful. Now, hoping you can help demystify this next one for our listeners. What is the hydrogen energy fund? What is special about hydrogen, and how do you think it will support Ontario's reliability needs and decarbonization? 
Yeah, it it is a it is a new word and a new way of thinking for for a lot of folks. So let me dig into that. the The goal of our hydrogen innovation fund is to investigate, evaluate, and demonstrate how low carbon hydrogen technologies could be integrated into the grid. The new program will enable the IESO to test the ability of hydrogen to support grid reliability and affordability, but also the role it can play in broader decarbonization. Hydrogen has the potential to reduce electricity sector emissions, but it could also be used as a replacement fuel in other more fossil fuel intensive industries, such as transportation. From the electricity sector's perspective, hydrogen has the potential to provide several essential services. It can smooth the output from renewable resources such as wind and solar. It can be blended into natural gas to reduce total emissions and could be used to offer several services such as peaking generation, grid efficiency, and storage. But all that being said, it's not an ultimate solution. While hydrogen can be used to generate electricity, producing it also requires electricity. So the integration of hydrogen, like all new resources, will require a balanced approach, one that can make more efficient use of our existing electricity system assets, which the Hydrogen Innovation Fund will help with. The interest in the fund has been very high. The ISO has received more than 25 applications. Uh, The projects are uh, in flight now are undergoing review right now, and we should be in a position to announce the successful projects in September. Leslie, let's now look globally. What are other countries doing right that Canada should consider emulating or even adopting? Yeah, I think I think this is um, you know very important. We very much focused on on Canada or in you know in our case Ontario uh, for for uh, for answers. And the IESO is just one one of many electricity system operators worldwide. And um, I certainly am always keeping an eye on what other countries are doing. Uh, however, every jurisdiction has unique circumstances which include laws, regulations, geography, and politics that that, that sometimes make uh, comparisons difficult. In North America specifically, Ontario is a leader in many ways, um, and the Pathways Report is a very well thought out approach. Um, uh, and so I think that's an area of interest that others have looked to us. That uh, coupled with our experience of phasing out coal-fired generation Uh, We're in a good position, really, to set examples for other jurisdictions looking to do similar work. And and certainly in conversations with my ISO counterparts around North America, we're um, we're having robust discussions uh, and learning from each other. Well, looking to the future of this industry and Canada's approach, what is giving you hope? Well, electricity is being looked at to support decarbonization uh, of other sectors and to support economic growth. That's hugely exciting to see the broad impact our industry is having on society. And as we engage with broader audience, the collaborative spirit uh, across the sector, across the province and across the country we're seeing certainly gives me hope that Ontario can achieve decarbonization through an orderly transition that balances that decarbonization desire with reliability and affordability that are at the heart of our mandate. Lastly, Leslie, we always end our interviews with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. These were some of the more difficult questions, Dan, so I'm I'm certainly ready for these. Okay. What are you reading right now? So I just finished reading uh, a really great book, How Big Things Get Done by Bent Fliveberg. And I think it's it's making the rounds. Really good book on large projects and what we can learn from past failures in large projects, which will be uh, important information for Ontario. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Now, What would you name your boat if you had one, or do you have one? Well, I have a very, very small boat, um, and I have yet to name it. But now now that you've got me thinking about that, the wheels are turning. Um, at the moment, it's new, so I'm le- just learning to park it. And and when I say park, my my partner rolls his eyes and says, you mean dock? And I say, no, park. So um, next time we speak, Dan, I'll have a name for the boat. Very good. Um, who is someone that you truly admire? 
I think this was the most difficult question. Um, there are people I admire in many aspects of my life, and and I certainly wouldn't want to single out any one or miss uh, another person. But if I can be a bit general, given the role I'm in, I'd have to say it's the people who have the vision and foresight to see what's coming in the future and to plan and build those large projects uh, and large infrastructure investments needed to get there. What is the closest thing to real magic that you've witnessed? Well, I am a lover of being outdoors. So perhaps for me, it would be uh, on the morning after uh, a deep snowfall on uh, the trails around my friend's property being the first snowshoes out uh, on the trails uh, on a sunny morning. Uh, It's so quiet and so beautiful and it, it just feels magical. Now, what has been the biggest challenge to you personally since the pandemic began? I think for me, it would be helping my mom stay connected to to our community. As as an elderly widow in her own home, uh, it was uh, a lot of one-on-one contact for me with her and making sure that I could connect her to a broader social network so she didn't feel so isolated. And I think that was um, you know well worth the challenge, but it was a it was a challenge. Okay, Um, we've all been watching just a little bit more TV or even Netflix lately. What is your favorite show? So I I spend very little time watching TV and and when I do or or Netflix and when I do it's mostly documentaries. Um, I want to give a call out for a course I'm taking right now online, which is the closest thing to uh, to TV. Um, I'm taking the uh, University of Alberta's Indigenous Canada course, uh, which has been for me a tremendous value in helping me understand Indigenous worldviews and perspectives. But I did just watch a Netflix series on the Tour de France, which was a fascinating look at the teams and tactics, as well as the the effort that the athletes endure over that 21 days. Okay, cool. Now, lastly, what is exciting you about your industry right now? Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, my teams have heard me use this before. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, we have an opportunity as an industry right now to guide generational change and to have an impact on the environment and the economy far past our working lives. uh, And that is incredibly exciting. Well, Leslie, this is it. We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. If our listeners wanted to learn more about you or your organization, how can they connect? Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, www.ieso.ca. Our website has a wealth of resources to help listeners uh, become more energy literate uh, and to understand the work we do. Uh, and you can find me on LinkedIn at Leslie Gallinger. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had a lot of fun. Cheers. I did. The questions were tough, uh, but very interesting. And they certainly got to the heart of the work that we do at the IESO. Uh, Thank you, Dan, for for your interest in our work and for asking those questions that that allow uh, me to speak and highlight the work of the incredible professionals that work at the IESO. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.